discussing pure and undefiled religion. If you open up with James, we're going to be finishing chapter 1 today, verses 26 and 27. And I'm excited to preach on these, this passage, but before we even get to this passage, I want to read a little bit, back it up a little bit to verse 22. We'll start from verse 22 and we'll read up into this passage. James 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not, only, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, being no hearer, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. A religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you that you grant us another opportunity to be in your house today, Lord, and read your word. Father, I ask that your word would penetrate into our heart, Lord, open our eyes to your truths, Lord, and see, see where the change needs to occur, Lord. Convict us with your word, Lord, and work on all of us individually. Bless the service. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So over and over in the scripture, it deals with a Three things. It deals with saved people, it deals with unsaved people, and it deals with people who think they're saved, but they're not saved. I mean, Mark already opened up today, and I thought he was going to read what I thought he was going to read, but he read later. But uh, Matthew chapter 25, you guys remember the parable of ten virgins, right? There were five wise, five unwise. But from a distance, ten virgins, they're all the same. They dressed in the same garment. They were hanging out, doing the same thing. They were in the same building, you know, they worshiped, they did all the duties that were the same. You can't differentiate between them. There was, they were all virgins, they were dressed in the same garment. But when the cry came, the groom is coming, that is where the split happened. There were five that were prepared for it, they had the oil, they had the lamps, and then there were five that had everything that looks like they're prepared. They even had the same model lamp, you know, they probably bought a bed, bath, and beyond, all of them. But when they said, the groom is coming, those five were different because they weren't prepared. They, weren't, they didn't have that oil within the lamp. They weren't ready. They were missing the kingdom. And that is a serious matter. Jesus talked about it. James talks about it. First John talks about it. We deal with it uh, daily. The essence of faith is bound up in the way a person believes, and it's evident in their works. We already covered... Previously in this chapter, chapter 1, uh, how faith is tested by trials and through the hardships that we encounter in our life, and all of our reaction to them will all depend on how deeply we are rooted in the Word, how much time we spend with the Word. I mean, it will be super easy to provide a salvation or to tell people of a salvation to just be like, hey, believe Jesus, you're going to heaven. I mean, don't you think everyone's going to believe and they're just going to be like, okay, cool, I can do that religion. All I have to do is believe and not do anything, and I'm going to heaven? Sweet, I'm in. I mean, this building's going to be packed. We'd be like sardines in here if everyone was just like, okay, cool, I just, just got to believe. But when you mention something like, well, you also have to be in obedience to the Lordship of Christ, people turn away. They're not interested in that. And it's like, well, wait, I have to be obedient to someone else to govern my life, to tell me what to do and how to live my life? No, thanks. I'm my own king. I want to do my own things. I want to please myself. I don't want to please someone else. And that is where the, that's what it's hard for people to change themselves. James points out that obedience to God's word is a, marked, is a mark of a changed life. When you obey his word, you are a changed person. Your will changes. You're born again and your desires change. I just always keep remembering that example that Dennis brought up. Being in the garage does not make you any more of a car than, you know, what was the second part to that? Forget. Then going to church, making you a believer. Just because you're doing something, just because you're hanging out with those ten, uh, five virgins that are actually ready to enter into the kingdom and you're not, you just have the same robe and have the same lamp. 
When the time comes, you're not going in. Just like if you're standing next to a car for five years, when they start up the car and get going, nobody's going to be able to start you up with the same key and get you going. You're not going to be a car, no matter how hard you try to be a car. So when your life has changed, you won't be pursuing sin, you'll be pursuing purity. You'll be pursuing God's word, you'll be in his word. When we're born, we're born sinners. Yes? Yes. Can we hide the fact that we're sinners? No? No, we can't. And how is it evident, the fact that we're sinners? Well, it's not a yes or no. (laughs) (laughs) It's evident by your desires, by the things that you do. When you're a sinner, your your desires are to pursue sin, self-pleasure. Less of the eyes, less of the body and pride of life. Less of flesh and pride of life. But when you're born again, is the life of God visible in your life? Yes. And is it evident? Yes, because you're pursuing his word. You're, you're, you have a changed life. I was thinking about Romans chapter 7 when Paul says, uh, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. But he's struggling with it. And what does he say then? He says, For I have a desire to do what is right. Yes, I still stumble. Yes, I fall. Yes, I I sin, but I don't want to do those. The things I do, I don't do, but I have a desire to do what is right. This is the changed person in me, and I pursue that. 1 John chapters 2, 3, and 4 talk about this. For for this we know him. Why? Because we keep his commandments. We do what he commands us to do. We follow his word. Now going back to the text, verse 22, he says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And he gives a, an example of a man in the mirror. I mean, Dennis talked a lot about this last week. I just want to touch a little bit. That when he walks away, he forgets what he saw. There's those, there's those who hear the word. They hear that they need to change something in their life. They're convicted. But as soon as they walk away, nothing happens. They're, they just forgot what they saw in the mirror. Nothing changes. And then there are those who are looking in the mirror like, oh man, I got to fix this before I walk away, before I forget that I'm messed up. You know, I have this big zit right here that I need to f- take care of. So there's the man that looks in the mirror and he sees that. He needs to fi- fix this. He'll fix it immediately at that point. And that is a sign of a redeemed life. When you hear that you, you got, God's word is convicting you, you're not going to lay it off like, okay, I'll take care of it later. Because as soon as you walk away, you're forgetting about it. So when the redeemed person changes immediately, sees what needs to be changed and prays God, for God's help to change that. And that is a blessing. Jesus, uh, Dennis said, Jesus came to change not the fruit, but the root. I like that from last week. He's not, he's, he came to change the root. It's a heart matter. So if God's word convicts you today, don't leave. Stay. Pray. Change. Look into the word. You see two things. You see your sin and you see your Savior. You will see your sin and how unworthy you are, how dirty you are, how sinful you are. And then you will see the cross and whose blood cleanses you from all the sin. And your response will be a desire to live out the word and be blessed in it. It's a lifestyle change. It's not just a momentary thing. As we approach the verses for today, verses 26 and 27 now, Perfect timing. <laughs> if anyone thinks he's religious, thinks. In some, uh, some versions it says, seems himself to be religious. Saying that it's like, well, you know, I do all the things that religious people do. I guess I must be religious, you know. If I drink gasoline and I stand in the garage, I guess I must be a car. No. I'm aggressive. I go to church meetings. I sing. You know, I play in band. I go to groups. I, I do everything. I guess... I'm religious. What Jesus is saying, it says, if you're, a, if you're a doer of the word and you do all those things, but you haven't even bridled your tongue, it's all useless. I mean, if you guys think, I'm not, not here to uh, look at me and all, but today I got an opportunity to ride a horse. And before I got to ride the horse, I got to put the bridle in its mouth and just to see how such a small little thing controls the whole beast. There I am sitting on it, you know, and I can stop it, I can turn it left, right, tell it one to go, all because I, I've bridled the, the tongue of the horse. And the horse has no say anymore. You put this metal piece in their mouth, and then they're yours. So 
So Jesus is saying, you can do all these things. You can be this massive horse, but if, you have, if you're not bridled, if your tongue is not bridled, am I saying it wrong? Oh, okay. God, I was always debating, like, is it bridled or is it bridled? But then I think it's bridled because the thing is called bridle. So I'm just going with that. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone's an English major, correct me, but he's saying, you may be doing all these things and you think that you're this magnificent, magnificent horse, but if you're not bridled, it's all useless because you're just going to be going wherever. You're not going to have a sense of direction. Why the tongue, though? Why such a big emphasis on the tongue? Well, Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because your heart will reflect what's on the inside of you. Your heart will reflect your inner person, if you're a changed person or not. So then another question is, well, then how do you find out if someone's saved or not? Just listen to them. You know, doing some uh, online stuff, you know, because everyone's always like, oh, girls talk more than guys. I, I, I researched that. I was like, well, who does talk more? Some websites say girls talk more than guys, but majority said it's the same thing. And on average, it's about 16 to 18,000 words a day, we say. I mean, I know I probably exceed that limit, 18,000, and I know a lot of us do. Some may not reach it, but on average, it's 18,000 words a day. That's roughly about 54 pages of a book that we write every day, what we say. So if you want to know what's, what the person's really like, just listen to them. Spend a day and listen to them. See what comes out of their mouth, and that's going to reflect their heart. And then Jesus later in the same chapter, chapter 12 of Matthew, said, verse 37, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So it's, it's a big matter, our tongue. So if you haven't bridled your tongue, everything is useless. No matter how many words you say, no matter how many prayers you, you say, no matter how much knowledge you have, it's all a heart issue. So we come to the first point. Be the, doer, be the doer of the word. James says, accept the word in your life and let it change your heart. Live it out. Put it in practice and let it control your speech, govern your life in order to have this pure and undefiled religion. So then you're not deceiving anyone. You're not lying to people around you. And he continues in verse 27. He says, what is a pure and undefiled religion? before God is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction in their troubles and trials and tribulations. True religion is demonstrating love and compassion to those around us. Jesus said, by this you're my disciples. This is paraphrasing. By what? When you show love to those around you, when you love one another. And before who must our religion be pure? Who are we accountable to? It's before God. It's God's standard, not our own opinion, not our standard, but it's God's. To visit orphans and widows. He doesn't mean just stop by, you know, and say hi to the old people, and that's it. But extend grace to them. Comfort them. Show mercy and love. And that's our point, too. Show mercy and love to the oppressed. He uses an example of orphans and widows because back in their time, in the context when this was written, orphans and widows were the most neglected people. Nobody wanted to show them any time, any attention. Nobody cared for them. So I'm trying to think, like, okay, who do I ignore the most this day? And it's always the people that come up at a gas station. Hey, sir, can you spare some change? I'm trying to go to Dublin. Or, hey, sir, can you spare a penny? You know, I'm trying to buy myself a sandwich. And I'm always just like, man, just leave me alone. I don't want to deal with you. And when I was preparing for this, it convicted me. Those are the orphans and widows that Christ is saying you're supposed to show love and, and grace to. And here I am, not doing it. Mark of a true believer is a love for someone else, for those around you. So it's not only our speech, but our actions. First John says, uh, chapter 4, Love one another, for one that does, he is born of God and knows God. When we encounter broken people in our life, we need, and if our heart doesn't break for them, we don't have a desire to help them, that is an indication that we're not born again. We don't have, we're not changed. We're not changed because we're not broken for them, with them. 
And lastly, we must remain unstained from the world, he says, to keep oneself unstained from the world. The world he uses here is cosmos, everything around us. It's the lifestyle, the, the world, the, the, the morals, the values, the philosophy of this world, to, to keep away from it. It's a lifestyle, continually keeping away from it and not adopting it into our own life. So then, obviously, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, well, we live in this world. You know, we drive their cars, we uh, use their elevators, we wear their clothes, and uh, we go to these jobs, we go to hospitals, we, we do the things that this world does. We listen to music, we listen to the radio, cell phones, laptops. Is that all bad? We go to restaurants, too. And some of us like to go on vacations to Hawaii. <laughs> so is that all bad? Does that make me worldly? Well, the answer is no. But ask yourself this, does it govern your life? All those things, do they govern your life? Do you seek to have the coolest car? Do you seek to have the, the, la the latest fashion or to go on the coolest elevator or go to the most fanciest restaurant or go on the five-star hotel you know, in Hawaii? Is that what governs your life? <clears throat> if yes, then that's a problem. Yes, there are times we slip up. That is, there's no argument there. I slip up, and I say things that I shouldn't be saying. And sometimes I don't show love to the people around me that need it, to the ones that are in most need. And sometimes I get sucked into this world, into the pleasure that this world has to offer. But the question is this, when it happens, what is your reaction? Is your reaction, I want more of it and I want to pursue it? Or is your reaction, I hate this in me and I want to get rid of it? And that is where you've got to examine yourself. It's not our perfection that proves our salvation. It's our reaction to our imperfections. It's not our perfection that proves our salvation. It's our reaction to our imperfections. Pure religion is summed up into this. Be a doer of the word, show mercy and love, and remain unstained from the world. Check what you use your 18,000 words a day. What kind of book are you writing with your tongue every day? Do you find joy in serving those around you, those who are in most need of it? And do you actually genuinely care for them? And lastly, what is my attitude to the, to the world? Do I want to be more like them, or do I want to be unstained from them? As you check yourselves, I'd suggest don't wait till you walk away from the mirror to make the changes happen. Amen. Amen. We'll pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Your word is truth, Lord. And your word speaks daily to us, Lord. I just ask, Lord, that now as our week starts, that we would watch what we say, Lord, and watch what kind of book we're writing, Lord. Is it pleasing to you? Does it bring grace to you, Lord? Does it bring glory to you? Lord, are we extending love to one another and those around us who need it most, and are we doing it with joy? Lord, because once we taste what grace is, there should be nothing holding us back from extending that grace to others around us, Lord. And lastly, Lord, I ask that you would keep us away from the world, keep us unstained, that we may be focused on you, have you in the right view, Lord. Come to your word and find food in it daily, Lord. I ask that you bless us all. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.